Welcome to the second video lesson for Unit 2, Legacies of Historical Globalization. This video attempts to answer the question, to what extent do the legacies of historical globalization affect peoples of the world? The video questions for our understanding for this video are, 1. What was the difference between old and new imperialism? 2. How was Eurocentrism used to justify European imperialism? 3. What was the scramble for Africa? 4. How did British imperialism affect India? 5. What were some legacies of historical globalization? In the previous lesson, Foundations of Historical Globalization, we discussed how European imperialism laid the foundations for globalization as we know it today. This is true. European imperialism during the 19th and 20th centuries transformed the world as European empires, like the British, French, Dutch, German, and others, competed to uh, dominate the rest of the world and create colonies in efforts to fuel the Industrial Revolution. In this lesson, we will examine the legacies that European imperialism left on people, many of which can be seen today. You may remember from lesson one that European imperialism had its origins shortly after Columbus and other ex explorers uh, discovered the Americas in the 15th and 16th century. This led to what we call old imperialism. European empires motivated by gold, glory, and God dominated and colonized the world and created a strict international trade system known as mercantilism. Old imperialism not only allowed the European empires to become very wealthy, but it also resulted in the Industrial Revolution. By the 19th century, however, the European empires, led by the largest of them, the British Empire, expanded and accelerated imperialism, which transformed into what historians call new imperialism. New imperialism was a more complex system of colonization than old imperialism of the 15th and 16th centuries. In new imperialism during the 18th and 19th centuries, European em empires were motivated not only by gold, gold, glory, and God, but they had more sophisticated methods of dominating indigenous people in their lands. By the 1800s, European empires were transforming their colonies and the lives of the indigenous people around them. In an effort to civilize the indigenous people, and I use the term civilize very loosely, European nations industrialized the colonies, built factories, hospitals, roads, roads, schools, and other elements of the modern world. This resulted in massive and rapid assimilation of indigenous people around the world into modern European world. Indigenous way of life in many colonies vanished, usually by force, as native people were taught European languages and culture, including Christian religious values. In colonies where the indigenous people resisted, the military was used to crush any opposition and force the indigenous people to submit to assimilation. So in short, new imperialism of the 18 and 1900s was different from old imperialism of the 15 and 1600s in that European empires were interested in territorial conquest and competition to build larger empires. They were motivated to directly control and transform their colonial territories using assimilation and European values. Assimilating the indigenous population was justified and deemed as necessary by the European nations to strengthen their economic control over the colonies. This justification became known as Eurocentrism. Eurocentrism is a form of ethnocentrism where European values, language, culture, and religion is considered to be superior over any non-European or indigenous culture or values. In other words, European empires believed that because they were more powerful and technologically advanced than, than indigenous populations, they had the right and even the responsibility to control and assimilate them. By today's standards in the 21st century, we understand that European imperialism was built on values of racism and discrimination, and that the belief that Europeans are better than any others is just plain wrong. However, during the 1800s and early 1900s, Eurocentrism was a common belief and used as justification for imperialism. A good source to illustrate Eurocentrism is the literature of 19th century uh, British writer Rudyard Kipling. Kipling was a supporter of British imperialism and wrote a lot of literature about British colonization in India and in other places in the world during the 19th and 20th centuries. Have you ever heard of the Jungle Book? You probably watched this as a kid, uh, as a Disney animated movie. Richard Kipling actually wrote the original children's book, The Jungle Book, in 1894. Disney later turned it into an animated movie. In 1899, Richard Kipling wrote and published a poem titled The White Man's Burden, which is a perfect example of the values of Eurocentrism. The first stanza of the poem reads, Take up the white man's burden, send forth the best you breed. 
Go bind your sons to exile to serve your captives' need. To wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild, your new-caught sullen peoples, half devil and half child. Many people interpret Kipling's poem, The White Man's Burden, as evidence of the reason why Europeans felt the need to come and civilize their local indigenous populations. One area of the world that was greatly impacted by European imperialism in the 19th and 20th centuries was the continent of Africa. In the 1880s, King Leopold II of Belgium, who, by the way, was the worst, one of the worst human beings in history, claimed uh, territory in Central Africa and today what is known as Congo. He claimed it as his own personal property, and the Belgians were the first to colonize land that was fed by the Congo River in Central Africa. King Leopold wanted what was a growing, valuable resource in that area, rubber. The Belgians were brutal to the indigenous Africans in Congo. They were forced to harvest the natural rubber from the rubber tree plantations and were brutally punished for not working hard enough. They were brutally beaten and they had their ears, hands, feet, and other extremities cut off if they didn't work hard enough. Disease also spread through the Congo and as many as 10 million indigenous Africans died under Leopold's rule. As King Leopold grew wealthy from the rubber industry, other European empires also wanted to colonize Africa and get in on it. In 1884, the great European nations met in Berlin, Germany, at the Berlin Conference. Here they negotiated the carving up of the continent of, the, of Africa amongst themselves, and the scramble for Africa began. The scramble for Africa was uh, occurred during the 1890s and into the 1900s, as most of the entire continent of Africa was colonized by Britain, France, Portugal, Netherlands, Spain, Germany, and Italy. Africa was stripped of its valuable resources like gold, diamonds, rubber, and many others, and the indigenous African populations were devastated by brutal treatment and disease. The scramble for Africa was a major catalyst for the outbreak of World War I in 1914, and Africa was also fought over by the Europeans during the Second World War. Following World War II, however, during the 1950s and 60s, most African colonies gained their freedom from European rule as independent countries. However, the legacies of imperialism have stayed with those African nations today. Most African people speak the language and have the same culture as their European colonizers, and most African cultures have been greatly changed or even wiped out. As well, legacies of European control and brutality resulted in many African nations descending into civil war and conflict with each other following their independence. Countries like Congo, Sudan, Nigeria, Uganda, and many other African nations have experienced a lot of civil war and violence as a result of the legacies of historical globalization. Furthermore, most African countries today are among the poorest and least developed world, countries in the world, which is a legacy of having European empires stripping Africa of its wealth. Later in this unit, you will also examine the genocide in Rwanda in the 1990s and apartheid in South Africa which were both the result of Eurocentrism and European imperialism in Africa. Another country that was graded, greatly affected by British imperialism was India. The British began colonizing the Indian subcontinent in the early 1600s and has esta had established trade there with the British East India Company, which is must, much like the uh, Hudson's Bay Company in Canada. Spices, cotton, tea, tobacco, salt, and many other items from India were valuable resources to the British. To control trade in India, the British East India Company created its own army in India, largely made up of Indian soldiers called Sipoys. The British forced India to establish an English-style government and transformed Indian society modeled after the British class system of wealth and hierarchy. However, the British traded the Indian people very badly. They imposed high taxes from British goods that Indians were forced to buy. They treated Indians as lower class citizens within their own country. In particular, the British East India Company treated its sepoys very badly. And in 1857, the sepoys uh, rebelled against British rule as they understood the British were destroying Indian culture and way of life. The British crushed the sepoy rebellion and in 1858, Britain instituted a period known as the Raj in India. During the Raj, the British army enforced strict control over Indian people in the form of martial law, and the British government imposed strict uh, trade policies with severe penalties for even the smallest of crimes. To make matters worse for Indian people, the British destroyed the cotton industry in India 
as Britain was developing its own cotton industry at home during the Industrial Revolution in the late 1800s, and did not want to compete with Indian cotton industry. Prior to the Raj, Britain was paying Indian people to manufacture clothing from cotton grown in India and sold the clothing to Indian people with high taxes. However, during the Raj, Britain began importing cotton from the United States and manufactured its own clothing at home in British factories, which therefore, thereby put millions of Indian manufacturers out of work. The British still forced Indians to buy clothing from Britain, again with very high taxes, but because Indians were out of work, many could not afford a clothing or uh, other essential goods, which they were also forced to buy from Britain. Other resources such as tobacco, salt, and spices from India were being exported from India to Britain, manufactured in Britain, and sold back to the Indian people with very high taxes. Millions of Indians were uh, experienced poverty and starvation during the Raj. This would last until the 1920s when an Indian lawyer named Mohandas Gandhi led a movement of non-violent disobedience against British rule in India. Gandhi convinced Indian people they could be independent if they made their own clothing grew their own food, and refused to buy British manufactured goods. The British responded to this movement harshly with violence, but Gandhi and the Indian people stood their ground. They continued to use nonviolent disobedience against British rule and refused to buy British goods and pay high, those high taxes. Eventually, by the end of World War II, the British Empire had all but collapsed, and British control over India was weak. In 1947, Britain uh, granted India its independence, and today, Gandhi is a national hero for, for India. And the Indian national flag includes an image of a cotton spinning wheel to recognize the importance of Gandhi's movement to its independence. To wrap things up, let's examine some legacies of historical globalization. One legacy is language and cultural changes amongst in indigenous populations around the world. Indigenous people around the world live, living in European colonies were forced to adopt the language, culture, and religion of the European colonizers. As a result, millions of indigenous people lost their identity and culture. They were forced to assimilate to European culture and languages. A second legacy is depopulation. Indigenous populations around the world fell drastically between the 17th to the 19th centuries. Forced slavery, disease, and brutal treatment by European colonizers resulted in the deaths of millions. A third legacy is European migration. European people migrated to colonies around the world in North and South America, Africa, Asia, and Australia in uh, search for work in the colonies or to leave or overcrowded conditions in Europe to seek a different life and adventure elsewhere. As the indigenous populations decreased, the European populations was increasing in the colonies. Lastly, a fourth legacy is the displacement of indigenous people from their tra traditional lands. As European colonizers moved into the colonies, they forced millions of indigenous people from their lands in order to create plantations, railroads, mines, and settlements. European colonizers had very little regard for traditional indigenous people's territories and communities, and people were indigenous people were forced from their lands, and often conflict would result between rival indigenous tribes, leading to wars and starvation. This brings us to the end of lesson two, legacies of historical globalization. In the next video lesson, we will examine the legacies of historical globalization in Canada. Until then, see you later.